Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. I'm Ingrid Wensler, here with Adam Lasserbani. Hello. And Matthew Schmidt. Hello. Today we'll be discussing The Quietest Man from Molly Antipal's collection, The Un Americans. The story's perspective is first person, narrated by the quietest man himself, Tomas Novak. It begins with a conflict, or with what's irrationally perceived to be a conflict by Tomas. His daughter, Daniela, has sold a play to a small theater in New York. He fears that the play, which Daniela has told him in a breathless phone message, is a play about their family, is one that details his daughter's and his wife, Katka's supposed side of things, all his failures as a father and husband. Tomas and Katka separated when Daniela was two. Anxious about the play, the scenes he's envisioning of all the times he mixed up dates and left Daniela waiting on her mother's stoop, Tomas calls Daniela repeatedly. When she finally answers, he congratulates her on her good news, but he knows, even as he's doing it, that what he's really doing is trying to get ahead of the play. To find out what it's about and endeavor before it's too late to cast himself in a better light. When he finally gets through to Daniela, he convinces her to visit him up in Maine, where he's living and working as an adjunct professor. The story's present tense action all takes place in Maine, but in my opinion, time and remembrance are so deftly rendered that the past in this story is never far from the present, the present never untouched by past. We find out Tomas and Katka met in university in Prague, that she'd come from a long line of intellectuals and he from a family of uneducated dairy farmers in Moravia. We learn about the time Tomas and Katka spent contributing anonymously with colleagues to a journal called The Chronicle of Our Times, which they had to do in secret in order to keep from getting arrested or worse. Because of Tomas's fluency in English and the press he gets after being interrogated by STB officials for contributing to The Chronicle and withstanding their interrogation, he gets dubbed the quietest man by international news sources He's helped to get a visa and a teaching job by Saul Sandalowski, a professor at Collins College in Vermont. Tomas and Katka moved to Vermont with Daniela, who's just a baby at the time. At Collins, Katka works as a janitor. Tomas devotes himself to his essays and to Saul's dinners, where he's the guest of honor. Katka, an activist in Prague, unafraid to stand outside party headquarters chanting STB equals Gestapo, becomes depressed, small, diminished in Vermont, finally leaving for her second cousin's house in Queens. The story covers so much time and ground, but I think this should give us enough context to get starting. What do you two, to get started, what do you two think? Yeah, I think that that's uh, an unusually uh, thorough description <laughs> of, yeah, no, of the things that happen in the forest, man. Um, I think without dealing uh, with the ending and how it plays out, which I hope we'll get to yeah. uh, inevitably because it's it's part of the, the sort of structural or formal play of what the narrative's up to. Yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, a lot of this is, you know, part of what we'll be discussing within the story. Um, I think we'll get into that with your first question. Okay, um, well, let's talk first about Tomas and how his character gets developed. Many of his thoughts are anxious ones um, that are missing some larger point about how to live better and in ways that are more in line with his goals. In trying to convince Daniela to come visit him in Maine, for example, he proposes stopping for a taffy at Ocean Street Pier. After she initially turns him down, Thomas's heart quote-unquote flops. He thinks, didn't she used to have a sweet tooth? I had no idea what she did like. We find out in just a beat that Daniela hasn't necessarily said no because she dislikes taffy. She's 
overwhelmed by the acceptance of her play and wants to pour more time into it. I'm wondering if we could look at this moment together and others like it. How does Tomas tend to think and behave? What patterns did you notice? Yeah, I think that Tomas is very occupied with himself. Um, mm, yeah. And I think because he's anxious, I don't know that at the beginning of the the story that he's inherently going to be that way all the time, right? Like, there's a sort of high-pressure situation anytime someone <laughs> finds out that they're um, part of someone else's literature, right? Like, uh, Fenton Johnson uh, told me one time that, you know, he likes to tell people that it's dangerous to be the relative of a writer and I think that's probably uh, pretty true um, or it's you know it's dangerous to be anybody's relative because people have their own interpretations of things I think in Saul's case, Saul's case Tomas's case um, you know because of some of the things that happened to him he has a moment of envisioning grandeur or security or that he's you know quote unquote made it even if accidentally um and his political work has come to something even if that means sort of obligatory emigration um and i think he's looking back at the inadequacies of his life anyway and I don't know that he had to be a better father by the end of the story, or that he, um, I'm not 100% sure that he's always striking out in the ways or to the extents that he thinks he's striking out, but he definitively, uh, in these moments, is not killing it. It's just recognizing his daughter's anxieties for what they are, <laughs> and mm. I think he's not asking questions about that but that's I think part of the like intelligence of the structure of the story is because he's sort of closed out and and having internal flashbacks and sort of telling his own narrative to himself in this slightly deprecating way mm. um, and remembering his failures we get some insight into him that even if Daniela hated him in the ways that he's fearful of um, I don't think we would, you know, we wouldn't, through her eyes or through Kafka's eyes, get his sort of acceptance of how he's messed up and how he's, you know, the ways he, things he wished he would have done or things he wished he would have traded out, which part of it is engaging about the story to me. Yeah, uh, Adam's already talked about how he's wrapped up in his own head and I think, you know, over time, his his learning curve has been a bit strange, right? Coming from a small farming community in Moravia to uh, Prague uh, is a big step for anyone. Um, and then, uh, you know, becoming a writer for a dissident journal right and finally being arrested for it um, he I don't think fully understood what he was getting into from the start and some of that is reflected in how he thinks about himself because it feels like he has a hard time understanding himself let alone anyone else and so he's seems very preoccupied with doing things that will make him look good because the one time he looked good was when he was dubbed the quietest man for not ratting out his counterparts on the newspaper and so you know he wants to uphold his status as an important person and part of upholding that status as an important person is making sure 
he is not denigrated in his daughter's play. Um, I think the other thing is he's wrestling with the fact that Katka has come from a family with a good background, uh, a family of writers, mm -hmm. and she was always a better writer than he was, and she was always more bold than he was. And I think in that particular marriage, right, like, he always felt like he was the lesser component, and so everything he does is to try to either be equal or better yeah. than who mm -hmm. Katka is. And so I don't think he ever gave up on that struggle, particularly because we see Katka leave with Daniela, and we learn, you know, that they are still very close, Katka and Daniela, and he has no idea what's going on. Yeah. And so a lot of his anxiety stems from, you know, being alone in the northeastern United States and falling from prominence at the university or college that uh, helped extradite him uh, from Czechoslovakia because uh, you know the communist reign ends roughly three years after he's there and they move on to another country Bosnia which is having similar problems Yeah, which I think is also a lot about I don't want to stomp on any of your other questions, Ingrid, but I think does have a lot to do with, right, like there's a certain thing that we learn about Tomas over the course of the narrative where, and one, because he isn't, he's from a farming family in Moravia, he's had to pursue something in a way, he hasn't had certain advantages, right, and so the goal of becoming a professor, the goal of becoming an academic and a writer and, a, you know, someone in the white tower or the ivory tower or sort of white collar is um, something that he has to achieve um, and in that way I don't know that we ever really learn whether or not Katka really was like a better writer or a more talented person or a braver person than he was I think he's got a lot of insecurity around those things mm. and he has an idea of that and I don't think it's explicit but there are these issues of right the gender politics of him being the one who's taken and her ability to like go out and scream STV equals Gestapo um, and then there's also right like this other set of questions about how being abused becomes that tool for being uplifted um and right like he has a certain skill set and proficiency in english which is caught his limitation for the early part of their time in america and that's you know that's what's apart from him being the sexier like this person was you know arrested element um he can communicate with the other people and around him and Kaka can't do that so she becomes a janitor and that's this sort of tragic Emma Gray story she's very adaptable in all the other circumstances she's not adaptable to that that's um, unfair comparison and I think he's trying to find a way into thinking that out and there are so many factors about how anybody in any narrative like the skill sets that you're born with, the unfair advantages that you have um, because of where you're born or the ways in which you have to strive and some sort of goal or pursuit becomes obsessive in that regard that like get caught up in there. And I think he's, he's working through that. And apart from the more self-indulgent stuff, I think he, he never quite gets to articulating what those problems are because he still has, I think, a... A sort of romantic fantasy about who Katka is in part because she's adaptable in other ways and a, a self-degrading 
aspect about who he is as a result of the way that some of that went down, at least within the context of Daniel and Kaka and this moment. Yeah, I think um, that's so well put. Um, I, I really like um, that in looking at the, pa the behavioral patterns here, the two of you are also looking at what the source of that anxiety might be for Tomas. So, I mean, the kind of insecurity he's feeling um, personally and in his relationship. Um, but also, I mean, I like it that you're, you're thinking out the perspective as well, and that we're mainly getting Daniela and Katka through Tomas. Um, so as a result, um, Adam, as you pointed out, um, you know, we, we don't know per se that Katka is a better writer. Um, we get that from Tomas and from his vision of, of her and himself. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's the perfect segue, actually, to my next question, which involves the story's other main characters. Um, Let's let's talk about some of them, like Katka, like Daniela, and let's let's think a little bit about um, what we can learn from Antipol's approach to characterization. Well, uh, I think what we know of Katka, we've discussed a significant amount of what we get from Tomas of her time in Prague um, when she. Uh, is in Vermont and taking odd jobs such as being a janitor. Um, you know, she keeps talking to Tomas about uh, moving uh, because she doesn't know anyone in New York, in uh, Vermont. And, you know, the only people that Tomas really hangs out with are uh, Sandalowski and his cronies at the, <laughs> at the like weekly dinners. Yeah. And, she tries going, you know, a few times and then uh, realizes that it's not something she is comfortable doing. And, you know, Tomas thinks it's mostly because she doesn't know English as well as he does. Um, but you get the sense from the way the story's told that it's really not quite that, um, but that probably it's more like you know, Kaka realizes this is just like kind of a way to have some fun and like vicariously live through what it might have been like to be uh, picked up by the STB and grilled for multiple days. And, you know, everyone has this idea that they think is what happened in the interrogation room. We later find out it's not as horrifying as one might have thought. Um, although only Tomas tells us the reader that he doesn't actually tell anyone else that he received food and that the guards were actually a little nicer to him than they probably would have been in someone's imagination. And so I think Kaka just realizes, you know, this is going to be an ongoing, like, loop where, like, every Friday he's going to go over to Sandalowski's, he's going to get drunk and, you know, likely make up some stories about what happened and why he's famous in this small area of the world, meaning Vermont, not Czechoslovakia. And... I think she also, you know, has no room for expansion in Vermont, right? One of the things that happens when she moves to New York is that she expands her business and actually runs a business and has employees, right? And there was no room for her to grow as a person in Vermont in the situation that they were in. Um, Daniela, on the other hand, um, really doesn't remember her father you know before a certain age and that is eventually uh you know 
something that starts taking place, their relationship, in the visits that they have together. And at first, uh, she is able to visit Tomas in Vermont and some of the other small uh, towns that he's teaching in, except that Tomas has no idea how to A, take care of the child, or B, talk to the child. And he's so caught up in, you know, trying to put out books and papers and, uh, you know, introduce anthologies that he doesn't really know what to do with Daniela. And so, you know, Daniela, being a human being, wants to know who her father is as she grows up. And it becomes increasingly difficult, even though Daniela does everything possible, really, to like get close to him. Uh, for example, uh, one time when Tomas is working on an introduction to the anthology, uh, she wants him to look at some of the things she's done. She made like a little city out of, uh, you know, implements from the kitchen and he like comes in and is not interested in the slightest right and so uh he tells her you know i have to get back to work i have these deadlines i have these things i have to do um and so she's like that's fine i'll work too and she like goes back there and ends up writing on his typed manuscript uh which he doesn't realize until later and since these are typewritten pages instead of computer pages, he can't just go ahead and reprint them easily. He has to retype the whole thing. And he gets absolutely infuriated and locks her in uh, the guest room. And, and this is where it kind of falls apart as far as the visiting uh, goes. Now he has to go down to New York and visit her if he wants to visit her. And so, you know, I think Daniela is close to her mother uh, because she's there. She cares about her. She takes an interest in her. And uh, her father's removed far away, seemingly in his own world, and doesn't really care for her in the way that she might expect. Um, and so we have that relationship, uh, you know, playing out over several uh, different moments that Tomas recalls. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of things about the way in which those characters become articulated that intrigue me. Um, one is that, you know, because we, Tomas has so much guilt, right? Um, that the the kinds of stories he remembers them and, and the sort of dissonance between the way in which like he's thinking about it the sort of intensity of like what a piece of garbage he feels like and then the sort of events that happens right like even as he's justifying he's sort of like justifying in a way that is apologetic um, often for example like describing to himself in his own head uh, what you bring up Matthew this like issue of his clean copies being like drawn on and written on by Daniela um, that give him a bunch more work to do right um, there's a lot of ways he could have dealt with that better right or that if he had been more attentive or if he'd spent his time differently and sort of sectioned off time for his daughter that he wouldn't have been in that situation um and that he could have said hey man like it's a real bummer that you did this and then like pursued his publisher right i think he he does have a mentality that feels really real to me about being sort of less than the people around him in some ways. He always has something to prove, which leads to some of that braggadocia 
Um, I say all that about Tomas again to say that, like, you know, like, apparently he's only at his first college for a few years. Like, there's only so many times he could have been invited to a dinner party um, during that time. And there's only so many dinner parties where people would actually ask you about your interrogation over and over and over again, right? Like, I don't... It's hard for me to imagine a reality where Saul Sandilowski has infinite dinner parties with different people at a small college over and over and over again. And they only want to talk about that one thing over and over and over again. And, you know, so I think I see those other characters, right? Saul is important. Saul is someone who actually did bring the family over, who gave them an opportunity to be where they're at. But... He's also a little bit of a character in memory, right? Like the whole of the late eighties to mid nineties to like, is just one long dinner party where he's the guest of honor or where Tomas is the guest of honor at Saul's, which isn't quite true. And so I don't actually get to know that character very much at all. And he also, right, like Tomas feels like he's pushed aside for someone more interesting um, and, but we don't really get the narrative around that. You take that kind of like, you know, butthurt feeling about it and you go with it. Um, I, which isn't to say that like Saul also wasn't the sort of dude that just doesn't enjoy sort of dissonant torture as a way to elevate himself. Um, I think Katka's a weird one in that way, right? Like on some level, right? Like, if you believe that narrative around what happens and Daniela just being, you know, an upset child um, and that Katka hasn't gotten a chance to get the story of what happened, she's wielding a certain amount of aggressive power to say, you're going to make this trip every time. I'm no longer coming to you on my half of the drive, which ends up getting alluded to as part of the process, right? Like where they're taking turns going back and forth. Um, and there's also a certain amount of like ability to be calm and like shift from thing to thing to thing for personal reasons, right? In, in her behavior, like she's got her own kind of determination. It's maybe not always oriented toward, right? The Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, depending on the period we're in, right? Um, but I also feel like there's a whole story there that's absent about, right, the sort of survivor's guilt of getting to escape a situation, but also having been highly engaged in trying to change a situation and better it and in being pulled away from it. One thing that, like, sticks with me about what she says to him is she wants to go to New York. There aren't people like us here, is what she tells Tomas. Mm -hmm. and memory I think Danielle is weird in that like we see her as a child and she he describes her as being creative and, and we see some of the aspects of that but he doesn't see her that often and there's a certain mystery about her right like all the things he remembers about her which is always really tragic about sort of separated families even when it's not like immediate family right like the things your family members tell you at like gatherings where they're like oh, do you still like horses or whatever the thing was you were into when you were six and they're shocked that you're 36 mm. <laughs> and you're not still reading like the Saddle Club books or something, right? Like, and <laughs> That's then, a real and, example from my life. <laughs> um, but I think that, that there's a kind of weirdness about that, right? We see her as an adult only a couple times. Right, the taffy and the sweetness mm. of that, right, like, is a kind of mystery, but in the way that anybody's a mystery when you feel uncomfortable and there's awkwardness between the two of you. Or, you know, at one point, the kind of offhand thing that gets said is there's a, that he, his yearly trip to New York is in July. So at least in the, in the last few years, something's been established where he only comes down very, very rarely or only sees her. Um, once a year or so. We know that she's ambitious, 
right? Like she's the sort of kid that is writing at night when she comes home from her job, um, who's trying to like volunteer um, at a theater in order to get like her play out there, but also to see other plays because she's like compelled by this art form. Um, the kind of kid that like is gonna shove the like the play in front of someone, but like also who like you know has a sensitivity and a nervousness about her, um, and I I think that's that's an interesting thing, right? There's a shielding through all of that. I guess is my larger point is you have to kind of read layers and right like in the end I don't know who saw Sandalowski is. I don't know very much about Kafka, and I don't know who Daniela is um, because he's never looking at them directly and he's interpreting those things. But I know that he's reading all of those things through a lens of loss and grief. Um, and I don't have a, a specific interpretation about what I think those who those people are, I think I don't have enough information about them. I know that there are details about their lives, and if I've described them in specific ways, it's largely to say, I don't know that Kak is being deeply mean to Tomas, or if Kak has like, got a good read, and he's got a good read, and he's underplaying how crappy he was to Daniela when she was 10. I don't know, I know that those characters because it's a story about his anxiety and fear and his self-esteem um, aren't as fully realized as they might be but I think that's part of the point absolutely um, this story is one of my favorite and favorites in a book that's full of tremendous stories um, you know, I think having read it, read the story over and over again, something that I see about characterization is that, um, you know, for for a story that's so preoccupied with memory, um, because Tomas is a character who's so anxious and trying to piece together what what kind of father he was throughout. Um, we get a lot of those memories in scene, like Matthew was saying. Like, I mean, I think the detail with which we we end up seeing um, Daniela as a child building her imaginary city um, is unusual for a flashback in a story of this length. Um, we also, because everything is filtered through Tomas, like, like Adam's saying, like, don't get the whole of these characters' lives or a very accurate picture of, you know, what Katka might feel guilty about. Um, I think crucially, she's the one who doesn't quite come together for me in that, like, I think the first few times I read this story, I, I very much saw things the way that Tomas did, um, because even though he's anxious and getting it wrong again and again, there's something He's at once aware and not aware. Um, he's he's a little bit confusing in that way, in that like he is he is aware very much so of things he gets wrong, and I think there's something that happens in this story where I'm inclined to trust his guilt sometimes, um, where maybe when I look at the story and I kind of spin it around and think about another character's perspective and behavior. You know, Matthew, like you were saying about Katka, like Vermont, for someone who doesn't speak English, is a much smaller place to come to years and years ago. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think about her not going to those parties and the way she sort of turns her body and shuns, shuns herself to Tomas coming home um, as, you know, something that she might have guilt around um, as an older person that she might think like gosh I, I might have been more supportive even though I was having a tough time like maybe we could have talked and I could have gotten through some of these parties and then gone to New York but you know basked a little in the success my partner was seeing you know something like that um, 
Which brings me to my next question. I think the past and present work unusually in this story, and I mean, to my mind, like really, really successfully, I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, mechanically speaking, um, can you guys talk a little bit about how you see Anthropol interweaving um, these characters' past lives? Yeah, so I think that um, you've already articulated fairly well that the story's mainframe is built out of right a moment where Tomas gets the call about his daughter's success, right? Mm -hmm. um, which he hears even that secondhand because it's a like a recorded voice message, right? um, and then he invites her down. And we're going to follow that throughout. I, I think it's significant that he or invites her up um, mm -hmm. geographically, but I um, I think it's significant that there are these little breaks built into the day um, or the, the few days that the story takes place over where he gets the information that the play exists and is going to be premiered, that Daniela comes... And then throughout that day that there are these sort of odd breaks of walking time or Daniela needing like a moment or what have you. Um, wherein, right, like it ends up working a little like uh, Ulysses uh, in that, right, we're dealing with some of the expansive flashback and thinking through those blank moments. We're not, instead of having to deal with every step that Tomas takes, we're going back in time. And so there's a sort of meditative movement that feels like it's in real time as he's walking around or, or panicking. And <laughs> um, I think that's a really, um, it is really skillfully done. I think that a lot of that work is done in those transitional moments between, mm. right, like, working through an anxiety and then drifting into <laughs> here's here's the evidence of why I suck or, <laughs> right, and right. why why my daughter is writing this play about how much I suck yeah I think those the transitional periods are done <clears throat> using things that happen in the present generally whereas once he has invited Daniela to Maine, where he's at now, uh, in the present time of the story, uh, she comes up and they really have a muted and unsuccessful conversation uh, on the first night that she arrives. And so he immediately calls Katka once Daniela has gone to sleep and tells her it's you know, going horribly. And Katka doesn't really uh, get too excited about anything. And, you know, what happens is Tomas begins to imagine what Katka looks like, where she's at now. Um, and that leads him to start thinking about where she was in the past. And finally, um, he starts worrying about uh, the closeness between Katka and Daniela that he doesn't have with Daniela. And he keeps pressuring Katka to tell him, you know, what the play's about, because he doesn't know what the play's actually about. Um, and here's an example of one of those transitions. Um, basically uh, Tomas has asked Katka what's it about and they're on the telephone quote I asked her Katka said but Daniela said talking about her work too early would kill it she said the last two words as though she were wrapping air quotes around them but I knew it made her proud to hear our daughter trying to sound like an artist and suddenly Katka seemed to be purposeful flaunting their closeness that's how I felt this past summer in New York anyway seeing them together at brunch over waffles Daniela had talked about her temp job and the new play she was working on 
she just read Catastrophe and watching her enthuse over Beckett. I remembered first encountering Anna Akhmatova's poems and feeling like I was sliding back into a conversation I'd been having for years with the writer. Even the new vocabulary Daniela was trying out. She kept talking about the exhibitionist nature of the theater. It was offset by her genuine ease at the table. She was so animated, talking with her hands, moving the salt and pepper shakers around to enact her favorite parts of the play. Kaka seemed to be reveling in every second of it, and for the first time I wondered if our daughter's desire to be a writer allowed Katka to finally accept the fact that she no longer was one. As I watched them, squeezed in the corner booth, swapping food off each other's plates without even asking, it seemed as though their relationship had morphed into a genuine friendship. And so here, he's still on the phone with Katka, and we leave that conversation entirely to go into Tomas's remembrances. And, you know, he is the one bringing us all this information. We're getting it one-sided from him um, about another time they were all together, right? And so in a certain way, you know, he's just giving us the things that stood out to him and not the things that stood out to both of them. Um, another thing that you notice is that... Um, he claims things outrightly at times, saying, quote, but I knew it made her proud to hear our daughter trying to sound like an artist, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. that's him literally saying he knows exactly what Katka is thinking. Yeah. And, you know, it's impossible for us to know if that's what she's thinking. And even if she is thinking that, it's probably not the only thing she's thinking. Yeah. It's also slightly, like, compellingly bitchy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then he compares himself to Daniela and, like, their reading experiences. And then he compares um, himself to both Katka and Daniela as a writer. And this is him just being like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. Like, I'm the famous one in this trio, <laughs> clearly. And, and yet they are still like absorbed with this except that really he's the one that's absorbed in this yeah. not them you know Danielle is doing something she loves and Katka loves that Danielle has found something to do that she loves yeah and you know one of the things I keep thinking about is that because this like this story is told in first person in a way I think to mirror the dissemination of information that the STB put out in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And so in that way, you know, there is no real uh, anti-claim from anyone besides Tomas. Yeah. And, and, and in a way, right, like he's enacting what it was like to be the STB yeah. in Czechoslovakia himself on his own family. Yeah. I think it's interesting also that I mean, you mentioned the number of times he does something like he knows, right, quote unquote, what Kat is thinking. But he also, I mean, that paragraph that you shared is a, a dead on moment to one of the things I was trying to point out about what he, we, we obviously don't know. And he admits that he doesn't know. I like, there must be three or four times he says she seemed in that, like, in that moment where there's that sometimes convenient admittance of what I don't know, but I'm still giving you my interpretation, which is a nerve wracking thing to do. I think it's how many of us think, right? Like, but receiving it as a story brings all of this doubt and interpretation onto the lens of the narrative. Mm. Yeah, there's a wonderful BBC piece on um, Virginia Woolf on um, Mrs. Dalloway, and it describes the ways in which in that book um, it's at once very much driven by the present tense of a singular day, but the way in which memory is so important to it and how, you know, you can be in scene and then fall into what someone describes as like this sort of deep pool of memory that's mm. also in scene. And, 
I think I think this this story works very similarly in that way. And that, you know, I mean, I think the passage that you chose, Matthew, is a perfect example where you know you are in the middle of this phone conversation, and then you slip into this other scene. And I mean, it's as if you're there too. You're not a reading it like okay, and now I'm reading backstory. Um, it's integrated um, very, very naturally um, in that these things are organically coming up for these characters. Um, now that I'm thinking of the BBC and Mel Melvin Bragg, I'm going to transition to my next question in a little bit of a Melvin-y way. Um, not to sort of hammer on what the past and the present have to do with each other in this story, but um, why include all this backstory and why begin the story where it begins? Well, I mean, whether you want to or not, you are hammering on it. And, <laughs> but, I, but I mean, like, I think, but that, obviously that says a lot about the story. You know, like, the story is so intertwined between the past and the present. Like, and that is the way people live their lives. And I think that's like what you're getting at, in my mind anyway, that, you know, it's inextricable to uh, think about the person you are now to the person you are before, because you are the same person. And while things have changed both outside of you and inside of you, you don't get to become an entirely new person. You don't get to subtract uh, what has happened in your past that is always there whether you remember it or not and you know the thing about memory is right like everyone remembers it a little bit differently so I think it's inherent to the story that the past is the you know weight around everyone's neck in this story that is pulling them down in a certain respect only Tomas refuses to take the weight off at any moment. Yeah. And Katka has basically, you know, lessened the weight in her mind by moving on and doing the things that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, she's doing. And so, like, that's, like, the, the difference in the choices of those two characters. And Daniela is, right, the product of these two characters um, who you know, unexpectedly is, is carrying this baggage anyway. And I say unexpectedly only in that, like, she didn't realize she was going to be carrying this. And mm. it, but it worms its way in, in its own way, because they're her parents. Yeah. Oh. Um, yes to all of that. <laughs> no, I, I think absolutely, right? Like, that we do, right? Like, there's a, right, like, adaptability is a is a big thing in mental health right like the ability to sort of accept what's happened and move forward uh matthew's right right like you don't get to like you don't get to unshoot the albatross right like you're just stuck with it and like there's no amount of penance that's gonna fix that i think that said katka does move on what she doesn't do and what tomas doesn't do is go like hey man let's go back to you know like let's go back to Europe and like redo it right like that there are what there's like all these things that happen in our lives and we decide that we're sort of stuck with what happens in our life and I think for many people that involves a certain kind of you know I sort of literally traumatic processing, right? I think in some ways the story has to start where it has to start. For the obvious reason, the call is an accusation and to, to mention Matthew's earlier point about like recreating the STB um, for himself or that feeling of a like Soviet influenced like Prague that he's Right, like, he's being accused in the way that people sometimes accuse, right? Like, which is to say, 
I've done something or I've made a choice and it's going to involve you and it's going to involve a representation of you. Um, and if you've had experiences that make you feel as though there are going to be consequences to that, whether or not the accusation is fair or just or considered or, you know, what have you, if you don't feel like the trial is going to be a real trial, or if you just feel like you're unprepared for the trial, um, that's really tough. And I think most of us who haven't been to jail or done things worthy of going to jail or lived in totalitarian spaces still have that feeling about our lives like we've messed up in ways that of course if someone were to present us you know like we would look like terrible horrible people um, I find this story really disturbing in some ways because I you know like my father ended up in the United States for significantly less romantic uh, arrest reasons but like came to the United States under sort of, you know, political duress of a kind. And I think often struggled to articulate those things. I think was always horrified any time I was like, I'm going to be a writer, Dad. And like that kind of representation and making sure that you have control of it, I think, makes so much sense but also of course there's that anxiety that the more you try and seem normal and good and like you should be represented as a, the hero of your own story i think if you're at all self-aware the more you realize that you come off plastic and weird and like you're covering something up and like overestimating yourself without naming your flaws accurately and in all of those kinds of things so i think it's I think the story is really shaped around what the accusation is and having that day or several days of not talking again, right? Like, I think he's reliving his four days, right? But this time it's, last time it cost him his family, right? And this time it's going to cost him, he thinks, his family in a more permanent way and it's going to instead of him becoming at least a temporary hero and getting the like the dinners at Saul Sandalowski's um, right like I think he's afraid that his daughter is going to get the dinner at Saul Sandalowski's and he's going to be written off as the bad guy in this situation I think that's a really tough thing especially if you are ambitious and coming from you know, I don't think being dairy farmers is like coming from nothing, but I think that sort of social, like hierarchy sense of coming from nothing, um, I think that's a real, real hard pill after swallowing a lot of hard pills, losing your country, losing your marriage, like feeling disconnected with your daughter not actually getting tenure and feeling like you have job security, working a bunch of jobs, feeling like all of that came from doing stuff that no one cares about because, you know, the communist regime fell apart and you're not politically important or useful to them anymore. That's horrific on the whole. You're hitting on something that's so important to this story. Um, I think because the story is, is so rich and dense, um, this doesn't come to the surface immediately. It's, it's kind of a quiet or undercurrent, but privilege and the difference in um, Tomas's experience and Daniela's um, is, is really important to it and uh, comes up in a moment that I, I realize um, in reading this story a number of times over several years, um, I have a kind of embarrassing, weird exercise that I run with myself um, with stories that I really like. I think about, um, over time, the moments in the story that stay with me best. And um, I, tr I try to check myself and see if those moments have to do with some sort of personal bias, like a connection to an object that comes up or something. Um, and one that you know, I do have a little personal bias in the mix here, but I think 
for me, a moment in this story that's very charged comes right after um, and out of the memory that um, Matthew introduces where um, Tomas is with Daniel and Katka. They're trading food in the way they are. You have like a visual for their intimacy. Um, but then Katka tries to give the two of them father-daughter time and Daniela takes her father around the city and tries to show him um, a little bit of her life and there's something about her showing him the theater that eventually takes the play where she's just temping and the way the scene plays out with him first correcting her um, she's trying to share that um, a playwright put on his old gulag plays there and her father corrects her pronunciation and what comes then is this, Daniela didn't respond. She looked like such a mess in a loose black t-shirt with her hands stuffed and her denim cut offs, her face blotchy and raw in the heat. This is my life, she said quietly. I could barely hear her. I felt as if we were on the loudest, most obnoxious street in the world. Cabbies were having detailed conversations with one another, with one another entirely through their horns and throngs of people kept pushing past us their foreign sweaty arms rubbing against my own. Daniela took a deep breath. I'm trying to show you my life. And what comes before this is a little bit about what, um, Tomas takes a moment to meditate on the difference between being a writer in America and a writer um, in Czechoslovakia and, or in Prague and more specifically and you know she he's he's realizing that for him he had to be charismatic and more assertive and for her that she merely needs to merely because of you know his his way of framing things merely needs to live as an observer um and, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's something that's at work in, in that moment that follows, too, where, you know, he, he's looking at his daughter and not taking the life that she's showing him very seriously because of the, the tremendous pressure that he was put under as a young person. He would never put it that compassionately, thinking about that moment himself, you know, he sees himself correcting her in hindsight and gives us that scene without commenting on it very much and I mean in fact does kind of <laughs> push at the fact that he knows that this job may be temporary and doesn't know that this theory will take her play um, that this is going to become a significant part of her narrative um, yeah. so you know I mean I think that that is something that um, is important for us to talk about here um, let's let's talk finally about the ending and where the story leaves us um, I think that's a good way to kind of go back to um, something Matthew was touching on before about how the story is structured yeah so while I'm gathering my thoughts let me say that Somewhere around Times Square, probably is the loudest, most obnoxious street mm. on earth. Um, but yeah, it feels like a fair yeah. description, doesn't it? it? Yeah. Um, and for all that, I'm glad that somewhere is a sort of centerpiece of like compelling plays, um, and that is where the story ends, right? That we get the answer to what that compelling play is going to be. And that compelling play is only about their family insofar as it's their family's inciting incident, right? Like, or him as the quietest man. Um, and it's, in that way, it's more about him, right? And he sort of ends up, you know, to Matthew's thing, right, bullying that answer out of her. He claims that Katka has, like, told him what the play is about, right? Like, he's using the possibility of her having intel and, like, ratted, like, Daniela out 
Yeah, a classical interrogation trick. Yeah. Um, to get that out, and then she panics, but she's just afraid to say, hey man, like you're this mysterious heroic figure to me, and I, I've written this play about you for that reason, and I'm struggling to finish some things, and I also want to talk to you about it so I can get your life more accurately, right? Like, um, and I think that's, uh, I mean, in some ways, like, it's a sort of classic irony, right? Like, it's almost, you know, what's the, the rape of the lock or something aspect about it, right? Like, but I, I think there's also something, I mean, it's, it's much more sophisticated than an O. Henry's story. I'm not, like, banging on it. I, like, I think there's something troubling about how that, that plays out because he needs it so badly, because he's damaged by this thing so badly that he's, he's turning against her. Um, but then I think the other thing that, troubles me about it is that he wants to give her he still wants to be impressive right in the way that like he doesn't get better on the second go around and that like when he goes to Saul Sandalowski's he knows he inflates the story he knows that Daniela wants to get the story accurately but he prizes not the accuracy she asks for but his belief or his interpretation that what she wants is to be a centerpiece Mm -hmm. in this story and so he ends up lying to her about she specifically doesn't understand how the like writing goes right and he lies to her telling her that like she was a quiet baby who got to come in as opposed to the fact that like they had to leave her behind because of the risk of like any noise in the room um i don't know i think all of that like all of that comes together really masterfully um, it says something really pointed about the hopelessness of like sort of cycles of behavior and, and the long term damage of that that I hope is better for all that but I I'm troubled thinking about it yeah the you know I think all of that is is well put and you know he the end of the story is his lie to her as, as you say you know and uh the lie he thinks is you know useful to her yeah. except you know the way he he says she's a quiet baby is quote you are my silent little doll yeah which is a really messed up thing to say in that, like, a doll doesn't have consciousness. And, you know, so I, I still think it's in question, like, <laughs> to her, it, like, the way he interprets her response is one of wonder and amazement, but, like, in a positive manner. And I, I can't help but think that she she you know is wondering that it's the opposite of that like a horrifying situation and it's hard for me to express like what I mean there uh, other than that like it's possible in my reading of this that she realizes he's never going to change. Yeah. You know, and that she's going to have to accept him for what he is. Because the story ends on him, like, wondering how close what he has just told her sounds like the truth. And saying that, you know, not yet, but if I tell myself this over and over, it might become the truth. And, and that's like, like, this is not a happy story. This is not a, you know, happy ending. Um, 
and I think like it works to achieve the experiences that come out of being under a communist regime and the long-term effects that it has on those people that were oppressed. It definitely does that. And it does so in a manner that is, you know, more than frightening. It's, it's like that ever-present dread that never goes away. Yeah. And, and in that way, you know, it's hard to, like, want to say, like, oh, this, like, our interpretation of does the story work or not, right? Like, it works, but, like, you know, does it work for me as a human being? And it does, and it doesn't. Like, it does because it's so real. Yeah. And it doesn't because you want to sit here and hope that as we've discussed, like whatever we tell ourselves to be the truth, you know, is not the truth, or at least not the whole truth. Yeah. Well, it's lacking in. I th I think it's not a story. With, I had a teacher that said that like every story needs grace, and it's a it's a story that doesn't. I think the grace at the end feels somewhat artificial in part because not only is he repeating that behavior. Not only might she be thinking, oh yeah, like he's doing this for his own idea of my happiness, but he's specifically screwing me over in terms of getting the details I want for this play that I want to write and that is about to be published. But also I think that you end up learning something about how he ends up being quiet through the course of that thing, which is that he's surely stymied by incredible anxiety. Um, and right like surviving you know legitimately torture but like not as intense torture as people think you're surviving um by just not knowing what to do is is a different thing than the kind of interpretation the rest of us put onto it which is like oh tomas is such a brave dude because of his principles he didn't do this thing um but you also end up losing something about him across the way where like you start to ask yourself around why he's been allowed to, or why he's chosen to do the things he's done because of what he's been allowed to do is strictly because of that. Um, and I think that gets sort of confounding, right? Like what he never ends up exploring is his own political principles. What he never ends up doing is saying like the right thing to do would be this and this is why and that. I don't know. That leaves me really. Uh, it does leave me in a kind of graceless space. Yeah, and there's also the fact that you know holding someone or something up as a symbol to mean something. Yeah. It's you know. It's like more than a double-edged sword. There's like already blood on the sword. At that point. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think you're both right that it, it really questions um, the kinds of stories that we have to tell about particular kinds of heroes um, and the ways in which we might not know what what a particular scene looks like for someone like I mean some he tells Daniela that she's the quietest baby and that she's there um, and doesn't tell her that like something they do to or maybe maybe he does um, it doesn't matter um, he one thing that they do do factually is they instead of flushing the toilet while they're there they pour um, water into the toilet um, because it's quieter um, and I mean, I think like that doesn't have to be a thing that he's ashamed to tell her. It's something that like Daniela would accept. Um, that's the kind of tragedy of this story. I mean, I think the personal tragedy that runs through it is that, I mean, I think what I was talking about before about him being like 
aware and not aware. I think every time I go back to read it, I hope that he's going to see what he can do. And there's that twinge. There's, there's also, you know, the fact that he equates himself with her by saying she was the quietest baby. And, Indeed. And, and the fact that, he, honestly, he doesn't know. He is not capable of telling her much about how to live a good life. Indeed. And it also brings in the strangeness that plays allow, which is acting out, trying to act out a truth or truths in life. And that, you know, she's an usher at this place before she sells her play there. And, and it's like this idea that you can usher people to uh, the place, but you can't make them understand the thing. You know, lead a horse to water. You can't make the horse drink. Yeah, and I mean, I think going back to something Adam had to say about, like, an O. Henry quality to this story, I mean, I think it, it begins with the play. Um, we don't know what the play is about. He's anxious about the play, and we return to the play at the end. Um, we find out what it is, and, you know, shock. It's, it's not at all what he thinks it's about. It's actually trying to be a flattering portrait of him, a way for her to connect with family history and build him up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think in a less competent writer's hand, um, I could just have a like surprise. It's not what you thought. Yeah. Um, subverted expectations. We're done. Um, and I think what ends up happening is so much more complicated. I think, like you two, I I feel the story bottom out in the way that it does, um, and the sadness that goes along with it. It actually like ends up doing something funny to me as a reader. This character, I often feel frustrated and angry with him for his behavior and um, his shortcomings, but I think coming to the end, I, I mainly wish that he, he could see um, how to behave better. Um, like It draws me to him in an odd way. So do you think this is a story of teaching us that we need to figure out how to behave better? Or what do you think the story is teaching us? Um, well, <laughs> way to turn a Melbourne question on me. Um, you know, I, th I think it's, it's a story that um, is so specific in the behavior that it presents. But I mean, I think we, the three of us, have spent a lot of time thinking about the alternative choices that characters could have made, which, I mean, is an unusual effect for a story that's so grounded in specificity. So, I mean, I think it does, in its way, want to be about possibility. I think it's a shockingly real story, as you say, right? Like, it's a story, and it, I think it looks at a very heightened version of a human experience. On a number of levels and it crafts that experience in a way that feels both real and artfully elevated um, but I don't know that there needs to be a moral to the story I think one of the great things about this story is it doesn't really have no, a moral no. yeah, but it doesn't have a moral for sure I think a moral I take away from this if I had one is uh, you know to quote my uncle Ron Art is a beautiful thing, but you should call me more because life is about the people that you have in it. And <laughs> I think ultimately, like, we agree that, um, that, like, right, Tomas doesn't end up living a life that satisfies him, and he has a lot of guilt and horror around it, and it doesn't satisfy his family, and those seem to be the people in his life. And life is about the people you have in it. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily trying to say there was some moral, per se. No, no I didn't hear you say that. I was just, you know, since you've read it so many times, <laughs> uh, you know... Like, I don't mean to flaunt that. I'm more <laughs> acknowledging an obsession. Well, you know, it's... I think one of the things it makes me think about is 
like an awareness of being aware mm-hmm. right like yeah. it, it kind of like reinforces that fact of like what am I doing in this situation and why am I doing it mm-hmm. and you can like lay that across like all the different situations you go through in a given day um, and the way that operates is that like you can't be aware of your awareness at all times you can only attempt to like reinstill in yourself like you know I should or shouldn't do this based on like my experiences so tell the truth and call your friends thanks guys thank you thank you